This session is reverse engineering the Supra iBox exploitation of a hardened MSP430 based device. And your speaker today is Braden Thomas. So with that, take it away. Uh, hello everyone and welcome to reverse engineering the Super iBox. Uh, my name is Braden Thomas. I'm a senior research scientist at Acuvant, uh, where mainly I these days focus on embedded devices, reverse engineering, and uh, exploit development. Prior to Acuvant, I worked uh, at Apple Product Security, so I have a very software-based perspective on hardware attacks. Today we're going to talk about the Super iBox. So I'll show you what the iBox is. Uh, we'll talk about the Android app that uh, accompanies the device. Uh, I'll show you how to open the device, uh, perform firmware extraction, which techniques I used and, and which techniques I tried to use. Uh, we'll cover the findings, and then I'll show you a couple demos. But before we get into all that, let's talk about why this is interesting. Uh, with Kickstarter and the Internet of Things, uh, you're seeing a lot more devices being created. There's just a massive proliferation of embedded devices. Uh, but at the same time, there's this increased scrutiny on security. Uh, and with you know these devices being created on a shoestring budget, um, they're, they want to incorporate security in some sort of you know cryptographic protocol in exchange. But they're storing you know manufacturers are storing secrets in general purpose microcontrollers, uh, which is super cheap and easy. But it's not necessarily the best idea. Uh, and the iBox uh, is a great case study of why that is. And finally, uh, because when you perform these attacks, you can hack into houses, and that's just inherently cool. So what is the iBox? It's a real estate physical key container. Uh, if you've ever bought a house, you've most likely seen one of these, as it's number one in the market. The competition is central lock. Basically, when you're selling a house, you put your keys inside, and you hang it on your door. And uh, other agents can come up. They can open the iBox with, uh, with their smartphones. There's three models uh, currently on the market. There's the older iBox, uh, which has been around for a long time. It's IR-based only. There's the newer Bluetooth iBox, uh, which uses uh, legacy Bluetooth. And then there's the, the Bluetooth LE model, which just came out this past year. Now, to actually open one of these devices, you're going to need a key. And the traditional key was called the active key. It incorporates a cell radio inside of it. Uh, but almost everyone these days uses eKey, which is an iOS and Android app, uh, because it's, you, know, you don't have to pay for an extra cell radio plan. Um, now, you're most likely also going to be using a dongle or a key fob. Uh, dongle, if uh, you're using an iPhone, for example, and you're trying to communicate over legacy Bluetooth, uh, or a key fob if you're trying to communicate over uh, IR. So they have these uh, Bluetooth to IR uh, key fobs. So first, the Android app. Uh, you know, I went after the Android app because it's, it's obviously super easy to decompile and, and reverse engineer. I focused on their authentication algorithm to open the key box. And what I immediately discovered is that each key has a serial number and a syscode, is what they call it. Now, a syscode is just an integer that uh, represents the geographical market that the, uh, that the key can be used in. Uh, for example, I'm from Atlanta, and Atlanta has a single syscode. Um, and some larger metropolitan areas might have multiple syscodes, like Southern California is obviously huge, so they'll have a few. Uh, and the very first thing the eKey app needs when you run it is that serial number and syscode. Uh, it asks for it in the form of an obfuscated blob that you have to provide. Uh, presumably, you get that from your MLS association. Once uh, the app has the serial number and syscode, it uses that as a credential to speak to their back-end web service. It's actually the only credential used. Uh, the web service will provide it with authentication cookies, and that's what they call them. They're just binary blobs of data. When you're attempting to open the iBox, the app will then transmit those cookies to the iBox over Bluetooth or IR. Uh, the, now, the key to their security is that the agent must uh, provide a PIN code, okay, in addition to these cookies. And that PIN code is associated with their serial number or syscode up in super server somewhere. Uh, and that's required to open the actual lock. 
Uh, the other thing I discovered when I reversed the app was that there's two authentication modes, programmed and deprogrammed authentication. Now, deprogrammed is, is rarely used. It's only used like if a lock is moving between syscodes. Uh, and uh, if you're actually out in the wild and you're opening a house, uh, you're going to be using programmed auth. Uh, programmed auth is very complex, and there's a lot of uh, cryptography involved in it. Uh, but from a very high level, what it looks like is you're going to be sending a cookie called the identity cookie. Then you're going to be sending the configuration cookie. Then you're sending an obtained key message uh, that, uh, that incorporates the PIN code, that user PIN code. Uh, then you're sending a key auth cookie. And then finally, you're sending the device open message. And at that point, if all those cookies and messages pass a lot of different validations, then the device will actually open. And uh, this, this can't be replayed. Uh, additionally, all those cookies contain uh, AES max, so you cannot modify them successfully. Um, on top of that, the, uh, the eKey app also sends what they call update bytes uh, with every attempt to open a lock. And those change every single day. And the only way to even get them is from super server. Uh, and they are themselves an AES Mac. Uh, additionally, um, while the E key is in a syscode uh, and has a serial number, every iBox also has a serial number in syscode. And to open a particular iBox, for the most part, those syscodes must match. So it's getting pretty clear that uh, we're going to have to access, that I had to access the firmware of the iBox to figure out anything else. Uh, for one, as an attacker, I don't have a valid serial number or syscode because I'm not a real estate agent. Even if I were able to obtain one via social engineering, uh, I most likely wouldn't be able to obtain the pin code as well. I'm not a very good social engineer. Uh, and finally, I don't want to communicate with Super Server to obtain those off cookies because then, you know, I'll be leaving a trace that, that I was hacking and, and they'll come after me. So let's get the device open. Uh, to open an iBox, the first thing you need to do is cut off this uh, hard plastic shell that uh, surrounds the iBox, and you'll be left with just the, the metal underneath it. You'll need to remove a couple of hex screws. Uh, the next part's a little tricky because you've got to open the key container. Uh, and the only way to do that is either use a legitimate E key or an exploit. And obviously, I haven't told you any exploits yet, so you'll just have to trust me that's possible. Uh, now, if you're opening an iBox Bluetooth, uh, it's a little trickier. You've got to also cut off the shackle, and you have to pop two rivets on the back, and it's just a huge pain. You've got to pry them up with a screwdriver and saw the tops off. I've done it a few times, and it's amazing. I still have all my fingers. When you can finally access the board, this is what you will see. Uh, the iBox uh, is on the top and bottom is on the left, and the iBox Bluetooth uh, top and bottom is on the right. As you can see, they both have a, a fairly large microcontroller uh, on the top. That's the MSP. The, the Bluetooth LE is basically identical to the Bluetooth, except uh, the, their Bluetooth chip is swapped out with a Bluetooth LE chip. So uh, those MSPs, uh, what you saw in the iBox, it's a 147, which is in TI's one series of MSPs, pretty old. Uh, the Bluetooth upgrades to an MSP in the 2 series. Uh, they both have a serial uh, IR transceiver, which is actually bit banged, um, though the Bluetooth also has a SD microelectronics Bluetooth serial module. Now, they both have EEPROMs as well, and the only thing really stored in the EEPROM is the visitor log. So every time you, um, you open a house, uh, the device will store that a particular key opened this key box in that visitor log in the EEPROM. So this was my, my steps that I decided to take to reverse engineer the device. Uh, first, I decided to focus on the iBox, the traditional iBox. And the reason I did that is because, for one, that board is super easy to obtain. You know, I don't need to pop those rivets and potentially lose fingers. As everyone here knows, older software is much more likely to be insecure. So it's a better target for that reason. And the, the important part is that the cryptographic material on both devices or on all those models is identical. The same E key is used to open the older iBox as is used to open the 
the brand new uh, Bluetooth LE. So if I can compromise the old iBox, I can open a brand new LE. So my process was first map out the test pads, and, and you can see I created this image as, as my own reference, uh, and that's just via simple continuity testing and a data sheet. Find debugging interfaces and perform firmware extraction through those debugging interfaces. Now generally, if you're going to perform firmware extraction against an MSP, you have two options. You have JTAG first, and there's four wire and two wire uh, variants of JTAG, though the 147, which was my target, only supports four wire. And if the first thing you notice when you hook it up is that the JTAG security fuse is blown, so JTAG is entirely prohibited. And that leaves us with BSL. A BSL is uh, TI's bootstrap loader protocol. It's a serial interface that permits read-write access to flash memory. Now, BSL is actually implemented using code that is stored in a special read-only, uh, for this uh, line of chips, in a special read-only memory uh, region of flash. The problem with BSL is that nearly all access to BSL is restricted with a password. And cleverly, TI used the interrupt vector table. Uh, it's a 32-byte uh, password from the interrupt vector table, which is inherently unique and secret. It's unique because uh, every software project has different code, so they're going to have different interrupt vector addresses. And it's secret because I don't know your code. I'm trying to figure out what your code is. So obviously, I don't know what your interrupt vector addresses are as well. There's only one command that you can perform uh, when you uh, don't have that password, and that's a mass erase. And that'll erase all of Flash, and it'll reset that interrupt vector table back to all Fs. And then it's a default password, and you can, you can connect over BSL. But you, you've lost all Flash. So in 2008, Travis Goodspeed released a white paper called uh, Practical Attacks Against the MSP430 BSL. Uh, where he described uh, two, two attacks. Uh, the first was a voltage glitching attack, and the second was a BSL password comparison timing attack. So I first attempted to perform the voltage glitching attack, and I had a GoodFet22 kind of lying around, and that has an ADG1634 on it, which is a digitally controlled analog switch. Uh, it allows you to switch between uh, two analog inputs using a, a digital line. I used the onboard DAC on the GoodFet, which is the digital to analog converter, to define sort of the high and low voltages uh, to glitch between uh, during the, the authentication check. I removed the chip from the board to eliminate any kind of uh, electrical interference like a capacitor, and I stepped down the power on all the data lines because the MSP runs on such low power that a full power data line will actually prevent glitching. Now, I should note that this attack is only feasible against BSL 1.x, because in BSL 2.x, they added a mass erase on the incorrect password. Um, so obviously, if you're glitching, you're going to need to be performing lots of attempts at sending the incorrect password and then glitching. Um, and if it erases all of Flash on the very first attempt, then you know, you're kind of screwed. But uh, luckily for me, the 147 runs BSL 1.1. This attack was a failure. Uh, so I, when I attempted this, the device either continued running undeterred or died altogether. And I brute forced uh, the every possible low voltage uh, to determine if there was a sweet spot between those two states where it would glitch. And uh, I did not find one. And my conclusion is that the MSP430 in the GoodFet22 is actually too slow to glitch another MSP. Uh, BSL runs around 1 megahertz, and the GoodFet uh, you can clock it up to 16 megahertz, but I still think that uh, it, it's too slow to do glitching using that ADG. So I moved on next to the BSL timing attack. And what Travis discovered is that the password byte comparison has a single clock cycle difference between the correct and incorrect paths. Um, if you look at this code here, uh, I'm not sure if, you're gonna, if you can see it, but uh, basically the code reads the uh, interrupt vector table uh, address or gets it, and then it receives a byte, and every time it receives a byte, it compares that received byte to what the correct expected byte is. If they're not the same, then it takes an extra clock cycle uh, oaring a NAC into a global, or will stin NAC is what I call it, into the global state. So what Travis's approach it was, was to send every possible byte, so like 0000, 
32 times, uh, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 32 times, F, 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 32 times, uh, and send each, so that's 256 attempts, okay? And uh, for each possible byte, measure the number of clock cycles the device takes to process each of those, and from there, you can determine what the byte makeup of the password is. So what you would expect to see is um, all the bytes that don't appear in the password uh, would have like a baseline uh, amount of time that it takes, and then any byte that appeared once would be like one clock cycle longer, or twice would take two clock cycles longer, and on and on. Now since the device receives the byte in between each of these, you really need to think about what uh, the communication looks like on the wire. Uh, now, it's, I said I mentioned it's serial, so there's one start bit, eight data bits, a parity bit, and a stop bit. It's bit banged by BSL code. Now, the problem, that the, the most significant problem, is that between the bytes, between the, the stop bit of one byte and the start bit of the next byte, the device will wait for that start bit to go low before, uh, before doing its byte rece receive routine. And that's a busy wait. So it just says, is the line low? No. Do that again. Um, and as soon as you've let it go through that loop more than just one single time, you've destroyed all prior timing information. Because then the, the processor or the microcontroller has busy waited for some indeterminate number of clock cycles, and we have no idea of, you know, how many clock cycles were taken in the past. Additionally, the device will check that the line is high after the stop bit. Um, and if it's not, it'll cause an error. So let's look at this graphically. You see byte n minus one stop bit, and then uh, the, the next byte start bit. Um, and you see where the device checks, and then uh, where all timing information is destroyed if that start bit line is not low. The time between those, the, the stop bit and the start bit, I call the inner byte timing. And obviously, we're going to want to calculate or determine what the ideal inner byte timing is so that we can perform this attack. Now, it's easy just to say the ideal inner byte timing is the number of instructions run times the clock speed. Uh, but what you quickly discover is that both the clock speed is highly inconsistent, and that's because BSL uses the software-based clock, the DCO clock. Uh, you can't force it to use a crystal because it's running its own code. But also, the number of instructions that are actually run vary due to the timing vulnerability itself. So you could have, you have no idea if one or more or fewer uh, instructions ran. Additionally, any mistakes you make uh, with a non-ideal inner byte timing will be multiplied by 34 times because you have 32 bytes plus a two byte checksum. So again, looking at it graphically, uh, assume that the default state has a very large inner byte timing. And so uh, in the default, in normal serial timing, uh, the, the inner byte timing is too large, and the device will wake up before the start bit, and it'll busy wait until it sees that start bit. Uh, now, in, in our case, since we're performing attack, we, that'll give us bad data because all that timing info is destroyed. Now, we're going to slowly decrease the inner byte timing to try to find the ideal, but say we take it too far. Uh, that, there's a couple bad things that could happen. Uh, for one, uh, it could check that the, start, the stop bit is, uh, is high when it's really still low, uh, and that'll cause an error. Or the device could wake up after the start bit entirely, and that's a giant disaster because then it'll, it'll busy wait all the way until data bit one, and then it'll think that's the start bit, and all serial communication will be bit shifted by one. It's a big mess. If you're attempting to perform this attack on the target chip itself, which you don't know the password for, uh, or rather if you're attempting to, to determine the ideal inner byte timing, you're kind of screwed. First of all, the, uh, you don't know the password, and you don't know what the timing is. So if you, if you get the timing wrong, if the device wakes up too early or something, you're going to get a knack. But since the password is inherently wrong, you're also going to get a knack. So there's no good way to determine the, the ideal inner byte timing when you don't know the password. You're always going to get a knack. Therefore, my game plan was to test this attack uh, on a same model chip uh, where the BSL password is known to find that ideal timing. Uh, I used an external crystal on my good FET, so I knew there were no attacker side problems. Uh, and I slowly decreased the inner byte timing until the, uh, the correct password is no longer act. 
uh, when I find the overall run with the lowest overall time, I know I've eliminated all those busy wait cycles. Uh, I know that it was still act, so I didn't go too far. Uh, I found the ideal inner byte time, and then I can take that inner byte time and I can use it against the target chip and perform the timing attack. And this is what I got. So as you can see, uh, along the x-axis, I'm slowly uh, decreasing the inner byte timing by a certain amount. And then on the y-axis, you see the total overall time it takes. And it's a linear decrease because I'm, I'm just linearly removing busy wait cycles until we reach a minimum. And at that point, the correct password is no longer acknowledged, and we found the ideal inner byte time. So that looks really good at the macro level. The problem is it's wildly inconsistent when you get down to the micro level. The overall time it takes the, to, to process the password varies by thousands of attacker clock cycles, which is obviously just crazy. Um, uh, keeping in mind that the, the attacker clock is running 16 times faster than the victim clock, but still, that's crazy. Uh, so the first thing I did was I attempted to modify BSL to expose the time at which it's actually testing the line uh, by twiddling the RX line. And by doing this, I was able to confirm that, you know, I'm finding the ideal inner byte time, uh, and it all looks, you know, pretty good. Um, but what I discovered is that, um, Regardless of that, uh, the timing is still super inconsistent. And I, I believe this was mostly due to the DCO clock. So I tried just focusing on the very last byte of the password. And, and with the last byte of the password, if you just focus on getting that one byte correctly, then you only have to worry about the inner byte times that come after that. So you only have to worry about uh, those three inner byte times for the last byte in the two byte checksum. This was my result. So this is with an ideal inner byte time, okay? I ran 10,000 times every possible byte uh, guessing at that last byte of the password. And I measured the overall time. It took about 24 hours. What you would expect to see in an ideal world is the overall time taking to process that password is a flat line for every possible guessed byte, except for one, the correct byte. And that byte would be a single clock cycle lower. But instead, we have this. The attack was obviously a failure. I believe it was a failure due to the BSL's DCO clock, that software clock, has inconsistencies during what it calls the tear routine. So uh, the way BSL determines the timing for serial is it measures the number of clock cycles that occur during its very first serial bit received. And it uses that timing, that number of clock cycles, to determine the timing for uh, the rest of the serial communication. Effectively, the length of the sleeps in its serial communication. Now, if there's any inconsistencies in that number of clock cycles that it measures, that, that inconsistency will be multiplied for every single bit that it receives. So the, those errors will be vastly uh, multiplied. And they don't appear to average out on the short term. So at this point, I was super frustrated. I had failed to perform both of the attacks that Travis uh, described publicly. Uh, but fortunately, there's a third attack, the paparazzi attack. Now, <laughs> this is a firmware extraction technique. Travis Goodspeed told me about it. Uh, and it permits bypassing the JTAG security fuse. Uh, and it's due to the photoelectric effect. Now, if you look at the JTAG security fuse, uh, on MSP 430s, it splits into two categories. The first is the 1, 2, and 4 series of the MSPs, and those use a physical fuse. And to blow it, or program it, as they call it in their documentation, you physically blow it up um, by pumping a bunch of current into the chip in a certain state. Now, the 5 and 6 series of the chips use an electronic fuse, uh, and that's just a region in flash uh, that uh, you write to. It's just a four byte address at 17FC. Um, and this attack does not succeed against these, these chips. So focusing on the, the chips where the attack actually succeeds, the way you physically perform the fuse check is you toggle the TMS line while you keep the TDI line high. And the chip measures current that's pumping in through that TDI line across that physical fuse. And if it sees current passing across that physical fuse, it knows the fuse is intact, and it remembers that, hey, we're going to permit JTAG to occur. To perform this, uh, the paparazzi attack, first thing you have to do is decap the chip. 
Uh, you're obviously going to want to keep your bonding wires intact because you're going to be um, you're going to be doing electrical testing. So uh, you might need to do jet etching for that. Um, I don't play with acid, so I, I don't. I'm not really sure. I just send it off to a lab. It costs less than a hundred bucks, uh, and it's so it's cheap and easy. So why not? Next, you're going to write a uh, you're going to run a tight JTAG loop uh, on the reset tap and fuse check operations, uh, and for that I use a good fat firmware application. Uh, now every 200 iterations of that loop, you're going to attempt uh, an authenticated action. Uh, now when I say an authenticated action, I mean an action, uh, a command that, uh, that requires the fuse to be intact. Uh, so what I just do is I just read the first address in BSL memory space. And the first word in BSL is uh, at C00, and it's a pointer to the entry point of B uh, BSL code, which is at C02. So if I get anything from that, that memory read that is C02, I know I've succeeded. I've bypassed this fuse. While you're running this tight JTAG loop, you're going to expose the die and you're going to hit it with a camera flash. It's probably going to take a few times. When you get valid data, you've succeeded. And by valid data, I mean C02. At this point, do not power the chip down or flip the reset line. Uh, obviously, this requires a good FET software modification because it likes to reset the chip all the time. Uh, I recommend that you power the chip externally during this attack. Don't use the good FET uh, to power it because uh, it tends to use a lot of current for some reason when you hit it with the flash. Do not expect the chip to be in a normal state. This should be fairly obvious. Um, what I just do is I just read the BSL password and then reset the chip. And then I just do everything over BSL because it eliminates any uh, kind of crazy stuff that can occur after you perform this attack. If you want, you can just dump the whole firmware, flash it to another chip uh, that uh, doesn't have the security fuse blown and you're good to go. So why does this work? Um, now, the JTAG fuse check, as I mentioned, works by measuring current that's passing across that physical fuse. The photoelectric effect is an effect where transistors, when they're struck by photons, release electrons. I believe that the uh, high energy photons that are coming from the xenon flash on a camera, this is just standard digital camera, are causing current to appear to pass across that fuse. Now, I've heard an alternate theory that perhaps um, the UV radiation uh, in, in the flash is causing the memory cell to get erased uh, where the JTAG state is stored, like Bunny's attack on the PIC microcontroller, if you've seen that. But I think that's inaccurate because a digital camera flash produces minimal UV, and this attack is instantaneous when it, when it works, whereas a UV, you generally need to expose it to UV for a lengthy period of time, like minutes. Let's see a demo. So first I'm going to plug in uh, my chip. I have a three volt power adapter here. Okay, so the good fed started up. It uh, attempted to perform JTAG and it got the JTAG ID which is 89 so we know that it's connected, the chip's behaving as normal and is prepared to do JTAG. Next it's going to uh, do this thing where it, uh, you read a certain register, and uh, if you get 555 back, you know that the JTAG fuse is blown, and so generally at this point, any other JTAG stuff would fail. Now the next thing we're going to do is start with that, uh, that loop, and sometimes this works pretty much instantly. Sometimes it, it, it work, takes a long time. So hopefully we'll get lucky and it'll work instantly, but uh, cross your fingers. I am on stage. So it, that wasn't too bad. <laughs> I've seen worse. Um, so you see we've read the, out the BSL password, 32 bytes. At this point you can pass that uh, to BSL and you can dump firmware.
So uh, let's talk about what I found when I actually dumped the firmware. Uh, a couple notes on uh, reversing MSP430 firmware. Uh, the calling convention I saw was ARG1 and R12, ARG2 and R14, and remaining arguments are pushed to the stack. Uh, the return value uh, is in R12, uh, but if it's a 32-bit return, it'll also use R13 because it's a 16-bit processor. The only really interesting thing that was that I discovered in the the actual process of reversing was that uh, they do do this thing where if it's a sparse index switch statement, uh, they call this common helper function, and that reads the return address off of the stack where the call routine pushed it. And then it goes there and it finds this data structure that defines uh, where you're going to jump. And so that's useful because IDA otherwise will, will not know what to do with that data. Another surprising thing I found is that about 25% of the firmware was actually dedicated to IRDA. And I didn't really know a lot about IRDA before this. Um, the Supra bit bangs the IRDA. It's basically just serial, but it has a short pulse width. So you have a long, normally in serial you would, you would have a large bit width, but in this case the pulse width is smaller than the bit width. Now you can actually uh, connect to a test pad on the iBox board and you can sniff the raw uh, IR uh, electrical signals uh, and then you can uh, read those with logic if you have a Soleil. Uh, it's easy to write a custom plugin to decode them. You can, you can export them uh, and post process them into a PCAP and when you do that, Wireshark, if you set the right data type, will open that PCAP, PCAP up and it'll decode everything above the, the link layer, uh, layer, which is just terrific and super useful. Let's talk about what I found in the firmware. So I found four things. The first was I, I discovered how the super crypto really works. You know, I had a, uh, some kind of idea after reversing the app, but you know, I, I didn't really know exactly how it works. The second thing I found is there's actually three authentication modes. I mentioned programmed and deprogrammed before. There's a third. Third, I found a hardware backdoor. And fourth, uh, I discovered that the memory read write command, which I knew about uh, because the app uses it, uh, is, an, is a command that's sent over IR or Bluetooth. And it, it only typically reads the EEPROM, which is where that visitor log is stored. But I discovered there's a hidden mode to it that per permits reading and writing a small segment of flash. And you'll see why that's interesting. So first, um, all the crypto that I saw in the initial protocol, um, there's a bunch of keys, but it turns out that they're all either derived from or encrypted with two keys, two AES-128 keys. The first key I call the device key, um, and it's actually rarely used in the field. And if you do use it, you get a very high level of access. With this key, you can deprogram a device um, to move it to another syscode. I'll, I'll talk about this a bit more in a little bit, but the most important key on the device is called the syscode key. Now, the syscode key is the root of trust for all those normal operations that you're doing, opening the device. Uh, and most interestingly, it's shared among all those devices within the same syscode, within a geographical region. And cleverly, uh, Supra ensured that these keys were never accessible to the eKey app. There's no way to get access to them in the eKey app. And they're not accessible via any of their remote commands. Um, so it's impossible to extract them via their command structure. I was expecting to find some sort of backdoor to read out the keys, but I didn't. So when I saw the Supra, uh, so to, the syscode key, when it's provisioned into the device, it's via some, I believe, unknown process that happens at the MLS office. Uh, I don't know much about that, but the device must be in a deprogram mode to do it, um, and I assume they have some sort of authenticated uh, channel to get access to those syscode keys. Um, anyway, once it's provisioned, uh, a MAC key and an encryption key are derived from it, and those keys are used, uh, for example, to validate cookie integrity, uh, the MAC key, and to decrypt any ephemeral keys, any session keys that are transmitted, respectively. If you compromise this key, it's sort of the, the keys of the kingdom because uh, you can generate fake authentication cookies. You don't need to contact Super Server to do that. You can open up any lock in the entire geographical region, um, which means you're not leaving a trace. The next thing I discovered, the third off mode. Um, 
So this third auth mode is uh, permits access to the visitor log in the EEPROM only. That's all it permits access to. Uh, but uh, obviously that's only useful if the device has been opened before because if there's nothing in the visitor log it's, it's useless to you. Now the key to this is that it requires no auth cookies to access it. You just walk up, you say, hey, I want to use that third auth mode, and it says, here's your visitor log. Uh, have fun. Uh, the important thing about the visitor log is it not only contains, like, contact information about the, uh, the people who own the keys that, that uh, connected and opened the lock, it also contains their serial number and syscode. And before, we were saying, you know, an attacker doesn't have a valid serial number and syscode, he's not a real estate agent. Now he has one. Um, but the problem is you still don't have the pin code associated with that key. Let's talk a bit about brute force. A pin code is only four digits. Now the device has brute force protection, okay? If you try to brute force the pin code live, uh, it'll lock you out for ten minutes every ten attempts, okay? So I did a little napkin math and that came to like about a week if you're waiting for those lockouts. The problem is that they're storing the lockout counter in the EEPROM. So you could build a device if you have physical access to the board that attempts to authenticate with an uh, authentication cookie that you got using a serial number and syscode, and then uh, you can do an online brute force of that pin code, erasing the EEPROM every 10 attempts. And you could very quickly get a pin code, and at that point you've effectively cloned an e-key. You, you can spoof a real estate agent. However, you still need to contact Super Server every day, so it's not an ideal attack. So the hardware backdoor. Um, I mentioned deprogrammed auth before, uh, and, I, and I call it that because the Android app only uses that authentication mode if the device is deprogrammed. When I, open, when I reversed the firmware, I discovered that you can actually perform that uh, authentication mechanism when the device is programmed, but you need to know that super secret device key. When you know that device key, which is unique per device, uh, you get the highest access mode, and you can do things like deprogram the device, uh, you, can, you can overwrite keys. Um, and it's likely only used by the MLS office. Um, uh, they must have some kind of secure channel to get access to those device keys, which I don't know anything about. Uh, however, the implementation of this auth mode contains the hardware backdoor. What it looks like in code is you see peripheral 3.1 go high, and then the very next uh, instruction, peripheral 3.2 is tested. If it's still low, that is, if those peripherals are not at the same level, then the back door is in effect, and the actual authentication part of that authentication mode is skipped. And that's because they're connected. They're a resistor. Um, you can desolder that resistor if you have board level access and you get a uh, you can bypass that per device auth, you get that high level access mode. It turns out you can also destroy the resistor with a single drill hole in the back of uh, an iBox if you know the exact right location. Uh, and then after that you can open it up easily with deprogrammed auth. So at this point we've discovered how to uh, clone a key but we still need to talk to super server. We figured out how to uh, open up one particular box if we have it in front of us using a physical attack. But we haven't really achieved all our goals of being able to open up all the I boxes um, with, uh, in, in the geographical region without contacting super server. And that's where the flash write plus erase attack comes in. So the keys, they're obviously, these secret keys are obviously not stored in the EEPROM because they would be trivial to read out. Uh, they're stored in information memory, which is a segment in flash. It's a small segment. Um, and that segment is erased by the BSL mass erase, so you can't just perform the trivial attack of mass erasing the device and reading that segment because it'll be gone. Uh, additionally, generally when these devices are performing, um, when, when they're writing to flash, you have to erase flash between those writes. And the way they do that is, so say you send a memory write command using that hidden mode that allows you to write to flash, uh, it allows you to write to this same segment. And the way it does that is it takes that segment as it reads it from flash, it copies it to a buffer on the stack, it then erases the segment of flash, it modifies the buffer on the stack however you requested, and then it writes it back. And it turns out that since the stack is in RAM of, of the microcontroller, uh, RAM is not actually erased by the BSL mass erase command. 
So here's our attack. Uh, first, we use the hardware backdoor to authenticate, uh, and that gives us the high level of access that we need to do a memory write command. Uh, we can do a memory write command to the information page at an unused location. We'll just twiddle a byte at somewhere that's not used. Now, when we do that, the device will take uh, that page, copy it to a stack buffer, modify it, you know, twiddle our byte, and then write it back to Flash. Very quickly, before the stack gets changed significantly, we're going to reset that device. We're going to perform a mass erase of Flash via BSL. And as I said before, mass erase is the only thing that you can do without access to the password. And then we're going to read RAM using BSL, since the password has now been uh, reverted back to the default password. When I attempted this, it was great success. Um, <laughs> so I wrote a special GoodFed application that counts clock cycles uh, so that the stack didn't get modified. Uh, I run that application right before sending um, the memory write command. I send the memory write command, uh, and that app resets the device, puts it into BSL mode. And at this point, at my leisure, I can um, mass erase the device uh, and read out RAM. Um, obviously, you can only perform this attack once because it's destructive. You've destroyed that device. Uh, but it doesn't matter because you've extracted the syscode key and you can now just go through your, your city or your neighborhood and just go wild. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to show you a demo. I'm actually going to show you a demo of the hardware attack uh, because the flash write and erase attack does not demo very well. This is a uh, Super iBox. Uh, it is programmed. Uh, I purchased it on eBay. Someone probably, I, I don't know how they got it, but they, they, they sell these things all over eBay and they're cheap and you can pick them up. Um, and as you can see, it's locked. Can't get access to it. And you can also see, well, you can't, but there's a very small drill hole in the back, okay? So uh, this uses Bluetooth to communicate with this uh, Bluetooth to IR proxy device, uh, which translates the IR to the device. Um, so by a Bluetooth turned on, yes. OK. So as you can see, this device just did a very simple uh, the deprogrammed off and it succeeded. And as a result, the lock opens right up. Um, at this point, uh, if you remove this hex screw, which I put in for purposes of demonstration, the entire lock would actually fall apart and you'd have access to the circuit board. And at that point, you can perform any kind of, uh, like the flash write and erase attack. Okay, um, conclusions, solutions. Uh, we discussed these issues with Supra in June. They were very receptive uh, to us and they've been working on these issues since and they tell us they're planning to uh, deploy a solution in less than 60 days. Uh, if you're a manufacturer of another device that's doing something similar, um, I would probably recommend that you avoid storing your cryptographic secrets in general purpose microcontroller flash memory because these microcontrollers, they have a ton of debug interfaces and very often uh, what you think are the, um, the sort of the ways to lock those down, there might be ways to bypass them if you have tons of physical access to them. Uh, thanks to a few guys on my team who helped me out with various parts and uh, obviously thanks to Travis Goodspeed for his uh, tremendous prior work on this. So that's it and any time for questions. Yes. Well, they do make uh, secure storage devices. Like Atmel makes a, a secure storage uh, EEPROM where you can you can keep keys in there, and they're intended to be protected against physical attacks. And then you can actually do the decryption of data on that chip itself. Uh, about probably by at this point, I probably bought like eight of these devices. Um, 
the the iBox, the traditional iBox is pretty cheap on eBay. They're like about 30 bucks. The iBox Bluetooth and the LEs are a little more expensive. But it's not that bad. Yes. Uh huh. Really? No, I didn't. That's interesting. And if you didn't hear what he said, he said that you can calculate the uh, exact current that's being released if you know the material that the fuse is made of. And, okay. Yes? Uh, no, um, I mean, so the very first message, so the question is what about replay? Um, the very first message that uh, you send to the device is like connection start, and you send it the auth mode that you're going to use. So if you're using standard programmed auth, uh, the very first thing it responds back to you with is a challenge, a random challenge. And that challenge, uh, it's not actually, well, it's interesting. What it actually is, is they take the, um, the, a, a number of different timers on the device, uh, and uh, they encrypt it with the device key, which is kind of interesting. Any other questions? How, many, how much time did I work on this? Uh, a long time. <laughs> As you can see, I went through a lot of failures. Uh, and I was obviously working on this in like side time, so it took a long time. Yes, uh, in the back. I'm sorry? Oh, so uh, the, the only one I've actually performed this attack on is the 1 series, uh, with that 147. Um, but I believe that it would work against uh, the 1, 2, or 4, but, you know, that's, that's my belief. Um, now, I did test it against the 5 series to confirm that it's not affected, uh, which it was a BGA chip. It was a huge pain to solder onto those, onto those little balls. But anyway, um, <laughs> So that's the only one I've really performed this against. Any other questions? All right, great. Thank you for your time.